Each year at this at this summit, we have uh, had some presentations that really talked about the kind of the state of the science, what we knew, what we were learning, what the future might look like. And so um, we're really pleased today to have uh, someone who's going to share some thoughts with us on that point as well. A couple of years ago, uh, Chief Pimelant and I were on a panel in Mariposa with the Arts Resource Conservation Districts of that area. And Stephen Estoya was then with the Sierra National Forest, and he was on the panel with us. Um, he's since moved uh, moved on to a, a different position, but I, I, I was actually talking to the chief the other day. We were both impressed by his stark reality. For all of us, we were just really in the middle of this, the, the, or in the beginning of the tree mortality, and Stephen was very candid in saying, if we act like we don't really know what to do, it's because we've never, ever seen anything like this and weren't trained to deal with this. So we're really happy to have Stephen Estoya, who is the director of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Climate uh, California Climate Hub here in California, who's going to share some uh, some thoughts on the science. So thanks for being here, Steve. Uh, so thank you for having me here today. So my name is Stephen Estoya. Many of you I know. Um, many of you I don't. I'm the director of the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture Climate Hub. Um, you can see up on the map. We're located in Davis, California, on the campus of University of California, Davis. Um, you can see on the map there are 10 climate hubs across the country. So we were designed in 2014 to help enable climate-informed decision-making and advance climate adaptation practices for, in our case, the state's foresters, agricultural producers, and ranchers. Um, I'm an ecologist by training, so I'm very interested in relationships, in connectivity, to look at something as a composite as a whole, disentangle it to make sense of it, and I'm especially interested in the processes, the linkages, if you will, amongst what's going on when we look at something. So I'm gonna take you on a little trip uh, today. I, ho I hope it makes sense. I've got a lot packed in here, so I'm gonna have to um, go forward. But I'm also very much a fan at, we have a choice. We can look at what's right and what's, look and what's working and choose to stage that, to daylight that, or we can look at and try to knock something down that isn't working. And I think, You'll see throughout this presentation, we have a real problem. This, we can't be sugarcoating it. We can't be waiting. There is no more time. And I think it behooves us all to very much lean in collectively and daylight the good work that people like Ellie and the Tahoe National Forest are doing and try to essentially put that into a prescription set so that we can pass it off to other forests so that they can implement that, those good processes. So uh, I've been asked to talk to you a little bit today about the condition of the Sierra Nevada forests. Um, we'll get a little more comprehensive for the state's forest in, to some degree. But I'll provide an overview of forest health, the impacts of climate change and associated stressors and disturbances, like the huge carbon emitting fires that we've been seeing over the last decade. <clears throat> but I will also talk about the good news, the things that we can do and know how to do to get our forest back on a trajectory of sustainability and forest health. And when I say what I say today, there is absolutely no blame, there's no finger pointing, there's no slinging mud on anyone. We did the best that we could with the information we had at the time, with the resources that we had and have available to us to, that have gotten us where we are today. But we need to look ahead. So I just wanna throw that disclaimer in because I'm very much a fan of looking forward and not looking back to, um, to um, pull something through the mud. So I created, this is my artwork, I created this very simple cartoon to illustrate that historically, much of the force in the, Cal in the Sierra Nevada region looked very differently 100 years ago than they do today. So you see we had fewer but larger trees, we had more heterogeneity, more variability in the way that they look, we had more fewer, smaller, we had more small fires that were not consuming um, large amounts of fuels emitting black carbon and associated greenhouse gases in, into the atmosphere. But today's forests are change systems. So for reasons which I will explain here in just a moment, we have more trees on the landscape, a lot more smaller trees. We have enormous fires at bewildering frequencies that are ecologically and economically expensive. We have outrageous costs associated with suppression. We don't have the capacity to work on the front end to address those issues. We're losing lives, 
homes, structures, watersheds, and all of the connectivity that's associated with the services that those forests provide. So this is what it looks like. This is where we are. These are California forests. Unprecedented levels of tree mortality, like we haven't seen in modern history. And we had, we've just come off the worst fire season in the state's history. So the choice now is ours. We know what the, the future has come true. The science has told us what to expect. You can look back 10, 15 years ago through the published literature. It's there, right? We know it's there. <clears throat> but what I'd like to do now is I'd like to take a walk through the past, if you will, very quickly, to understand what we've done and why we ended up where we have today. So this started with the individual combined or synergistic effects of, uh, effects of fire suppression. And I should note that we're talking about frequent fire forest systems. Our, fo our forests evolved with fires. They're set up to have fire in them. And when you take a critical ecological process out of a system, you can't expect it to function properly. Take one of my body systems out of me. Take my endocrine system or my, or my digestive system out of me. See how well I function. Not very well, I guarantee you. <laughs> but just to, just to demonstrate that we can't be tinkering with critical ecological processes and think it's going to look fine. We had... A, we had uh, widespread and very intensive land management practices that resulted in very dense forests. So in some cases, we have over 400 trees per acre, which historically may have only supported 100, just off the rounding up. So at the same time, we've experienced drought, and more recently, the additive stresses associated with climate change. <clears throat> and this has resulted in increased disturbance events like these enormous fires that we're realizing. So we know that when there are more trees on the landscape than can be supported by the resources that are available, they become stressed. And they succumb to things like bark beetles. Bark beetles are a, are a native part of these forested ecosystems. They're not invasive. They're not non-native. They've been kept in check by the processes that we had um, disrupted from the past. And at the same time, the globe is warming. We know this. California is warming. You can't see it on the figure, but this goes back to 1885 to 2015, and we see a steady increase in warming. And in the last half century, this, so this is a figure of the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Per, some would argue maybe not the best for making sense of, of, of forest drought stress, but the, the point will be held. You can see that we're seeing an increased frequency in the intensity of extreme droughts in the last half century. And you can see really, it's really small. I didn't have any idea where I was going to be, but right, well, it doesn't show up. It says 2014, right? So there was, there was the most extreme drought that we've seen in the last 1,200 years. And it may be a, this may be a foreshadow of what we can expect in the future. In terms of what we can expect, so this is a very simply generated plot from the CalAdapt website that anybody can log on, not even log on to, get onto and generate figures to make sense of the future. It's like looking through a crystal ball in a sense. Um, so this essentially plots four different climate models with a, an emissions concentration of 4.5. And that's the, the sec, it's, that's the second from the bottom of four that the International Panel on Climate Change have produced. Um, we are not on this path right now, but you can see that we have a steady increase um, uh, now into the, the remainder of the century. But what we can really expect depends in part to what emissions scenario we end up realizing. So I just told you the 4.5 RCP, so representative concentration pathway, it's like how much gas is in the environment down the line based on our activities. Um, may result in about, you know, a four-degree increase by end century. But if we stay on track with what we're the, way, the way that we're going and hit the 8.5 RCP, it's very likely that we could see an, a six to eight degree increase by end century. Six to eight degree increase by end century. And so... 
I know everyone is thrilled that it snowed. I'll just let you know that the drought monitor draft came out this morning before I got here. I'm a part of the network for the development of the U.S. Drought Monitor Index. We're only at 30-some-odd percent of normal. Um, this, is, this is a map from, you can see, February 6th of the Sierra Nevada. I, I know we're all glamoring that we have snow, but we have a long ways to go this year to get um, to normal conditions. Um, what a downer I am, huh? <laughs> But this, these are the projected, so this is the, this is the projections for snow in uh, the Sierra Nevada, in the north, central, or south regions of the Sierra Nevada. And um, it's been predicted that we could realize a 20 to 85, sorry, 84% decrease in snow cover by end century. So start skiing now. So with increased temperatures and a more xeric or dry conditions, what we're essentially doing is we're taking the bioclimatic envelope for our forests and we're pushing it. And the expectation is that due to those, why doesn't that show up on the screen? That's, it's because it's one of those like um, fancy screens. So, <laughs> which is fine. Um, but at least I figured it out. So we see that we're gonna have increased tree mortality down the line as a function of change temperature and precipitation. Right? And it's not a one-to-one. -one. That's not to say that you get um, one unit of temperature increase results. You can, you can offset that by one unit of precipitation. I didn't get going here. Um, so it's also been predicted that the forest drought stress could exceed levels that we haven't seen in a thousand years by 2050. So these are some figures that have come out last year in a paper published by Jim Thorne and others at UC Davis. This was a Climate Hub supported uh, project. I'm gonna go through it pretty quickly. Um, the, the top portion, since I can't use the pointer, the top portion of the slide is what the climate models predict if we have a wetter future. On the left is a lower emissions concentration. On the right is a higher. The, the, what you wanna look for is a, dis, is, a, is, a, is a shift from red to green. That shows a displacement of forested ecosystem. It actually shows it for all vegetation types. The bottom is um, a hot and dry future. On the left again is the 4.5 RCP and on the right is the 8.5. So not to mix words, if we realize the future that's on the lower right, it doesn't spell a bright future for Sierra Nevada National Forest. But there are lessons to be learned from this in the way that we do things. We need to catch up in our application of management actions as we move forward. So I'm gonna put all the slides up there at once um, because we all know this, wildfire area is increasing. It, increasing. Um, you see on the map, this is a, a frat, Cal Fire frat map, or sorry, figure on the lower right, you see the green bars moving from, uh, moving from left to right, a steady increase with a market jump in the last uh, 10 or so years. That's an increase in the wildfire area in the conifer forest. Okay, so we're, seeing, we're obviously seeing an increase in the shrubs, but we're also seeing it in the conifer forest. And if you look at the figure on the left, you see that we're seeing the greatest increases in our lodgepole pine and our subalpine forest forests. So fire is actually moving up slow. It's becoming more intense at our lower elevation forests, but it's moving higher in elevations. And this is corroborated in the, part, in the paper by Mark Schwartz and others on the right, showing that fire is in fact moving up slow. So I will, that actually has ramifications about vegetation change post-fire too, which I unfortunately don't have the time to get into. Um, Leroy Westerling produced a paper a couple years ago. Many papers are coming out of UC Merced in his lab. But this shows that we, and you know this, but we're seeing more large wildfires. Large, by definition here, is greater than 400 hectares. Hectares about, about the size of a football field, I believe. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned this already, but fire severity is increasing across the West, but it's increasing at our lower elevation forests. High severity fires are the types of fires that actually promote type changes. That's when you go from one vegetation type to a next. It makes it very difficult for a vegetation type like a forest to regenerate after these high severity events. 
When we look forward, this shows that if we realize this estimates, because it's a predict, uh, projection, if we realize a 1.8 degree increase in temperature, we could see an increase of over 300% of the burned area in Sierra Nevada National Forest. But at the same time, our forests across the country are our most important carbon sink. And this is true for the Sierra Nevada too. But the effects of climate change and development are expected to increase wildfire CO2 emissions, excuse me, by end century by about 56%. And looking even further out, it's expected that changing climate and fire could actually result in a decrease of 73% of total ecosystem carbon. And this is a projection model after several multiple here, multiple hundred year runs of the model. So here I'd like to, this is a transition. So that's a little bit of what, uh, what we can look forward to in terms of climate. We know that we have 129 million dead trees. So really quickly, I, did the, I wasn't a math major. I'm an, I've got three degrees in ecology. But if you assume that every tree was 125 feet tall, I'm also not a forester. I don't even know if that's true. But let's just say it. <clears throat> Every tree that died is 125 feet tall. You stack them end to end, it will get you to the moon and back six round trips. But there's a lot we can learn from this. We're learning that the largest trees are the ones that died. I can't use the pointer, but on the left is a sugar pine. That's highlighted in red. And on the right is ponderosa pine. Our largest carbon storing trees are the ones that died. So this is a very recent paper that just came out of Scott Stevens' lab. He's a fire ecologist scientist at Cal. And this is, a, this is a, um, what they're expecting might happen as a function of this die-off. Initially, and, and I'll walk you through it. Initially, you'll see a reduced moisture, moisture content of our canopy fuels. They're drying. They're dead, of course. So we're going to start seeing them fall, losing the canopy fuels. It's going to lead to an increase of dead and live surface fuels. We're going to continue to see things falling down for this is a decade out now, 11 to 20 years out. And we're going to see an enormous increase, unprecedented increase in our large surface fuels. So what does this mean? Scott Stevens and John Battles, personal communication, I don't believe this is published, but I'll walk you through this figure in terms of what that scenario means. If you can see the small uh, green box, before mortality, that's live tree biomass. You see it drop to the green line after mortality. You see a marked increase in the standing dead trees. You don't see that in the red? And then as you see in time, that standing dead tree biomass declines because it's falling. That leads to an increase in 1,000 hour fuels. This creates conditions of what the authors are saying will be mass fires due to the accumulation of 1,000 hour fuels that are not within the capacity of current fire models. They have the ability to generate their own wind and weather, excessive spotting, making, making even suppression activity, and I've never done anything in fire suppression, so can sorry. <laughs> but making suppression very, very challenging if it wasn't before. But they call for the application of prescribed fire in the next 10 years. And this is going to be a really challenging to see, but I'll walk you through it again. What you want to focus on is the brown bars and the black dotted line. If you can reduce those surface fuels, you can reduce the potential for surface fire intensity with the application of prescribed fire. In this paper, which just came out in 2018, uh, uh, Steve, or Scott just sent me a copy of it a few weeks ago, we have about 10 years to get on it in this case. So, but, we, but we've learned that, and manage wildfire is an effective tool. Compare the two polygons. The one on the right in purple is an area that's had 40 plus years of managed wildfire. The one on the left is an area adjacent that has not. All of those orange and red blops are high levels of tree mortality. Notice how much tree mortality is in the purple. We've got to start putting fire back on the landscape in safe, ecologically thoughtful ways. 
This is a busy figure, but it's important, and I'm going to walk you through it. Forest treatments and fire can also help. This is looking at the rim, rim fire severity based on antecedent fires or antecedent conditions. Thank you. In blue, it shows that only a small fraction of areas that receive prescribed fire and small wildfires or thinning and prescribed fire burned in high severity. That's good. Compare that with places that burned previously antecedent conditions previously with high severity, almost half burns again at high severity, in areas that were totally untreated, a larger fraction than the treated areas burn at high severity. Forest treatments, prescribed fire, managed wildfire help. There's an ongoing study out of the U.S. Forest Service Ecology Program that's looking at the effectiveness of the mechanical treatments on, um, on tree mortality, and we're seeing that they can work They're more effective in the north, where we have higher levels of precipitation or reduced levels of climatic water deficit than they are in the south. So basically, that's the El Dorado. I think that says Stanislaus, Yosemite, and Sierra National Forest. So this tells us that for the Tahoe, for the El Dorado, we're in a good spot, right? The, what we're doing, our prescriptions, the way that civil culturalists are writing this up, you know, it's, it's good. It, but it also tells us we need to rethink what we're doing in the southern portion of the Sierra. These forests provide enormous ecological benefits, values, services. Carbon storage is enormous. This is an enormously beneficial uh, ecological service for us. Uh, endangered, sensitive, rare species, all of the wildlife diversity. But at the same time, a great deal of water comes from our national forest systems. And I, I, I pull this out for a reason. The, The five forests that are the most impacted by tree mortality are highlighted in a different color. The three most impacted forests happen to have, by tree mortality, happen to have eight of the top 10 agricultural producing counties, either within them, adjacent, or just downstream. California has a, a 47.1, I believe, billion dollar agricultural export. It's far and away the number one. Number, Texas and Iowa combined only three billion above that. Water is very important. We have an ecosystem at risk. We, collectively, there's no forest service, there's no private land, there's no NGOs, there's none of that. It's us, it's ours. We have, the, we have a future of mass fires. We have Our, we, are, we are on a trajectory from going from carbon reserves to carbon sources. The watershed services that we were all dependent on, the, the 11,000 uh, megawatts per year, that's 11 million homes, that's electricity for 11 million homes in California, at risk. And all of the other associated ecosystem services, hiking, camping, for me, I'm a big mountain biker, all of those things are at risk. We have a choice. We have a choice. We have to act now. I, I've used so many analogies to make sense of this. I've scratched my head in confusion as to why we've gotten to the condition we have. I don't know how many more children are going to go through, and this is sometimes I have a little bit of a darkness in my personality. How many children are going to go through a, a very dangerous intersection before we put a stop sign up? The time to act is now. If we realize the future that's been predicted by the best scientists in the, really in the country are working right here in the Sierra Nevada are telling us this. They, I don't know how else they could say it. It's our choice to listen. And we have the resources to do it. We're just choosing to do it on the back end. Suppression costs just go up every year and the overall budgets go down. Less resources to put in the front end to prevent outcomes like mass sources and, and enormous carbon emitting fires. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you, I'm going to have to read it because I'll, I'll blotch it. Um, but there's a, it's, for me, there's a, a perfect quote that sums this up. <clears throat> it's by C.S. Lewis. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. And I absolutely believe that's true. We, we, we have the information. 
We have the science. We have the tools. We have the resources. They're just in the wrong pots. So it's up to us to make the difference to retraject these systems for all of Californians in the short and long term. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So for those of you in the audience who are sitting out there dying to tweet, here's a couple of hashtags for you. Supervisor, are you? Is that you? Oh, no. OK. Um, you could do hashtag CA Forest Carbon or hashtag Restore the Sierra. And you can do it during the Q&A and multitask. So unless you're answering the question, please don't do it. So I wanted to throw that out because you might want to say most uplifting speech I've ever heard from Stephen. I feel so much better about Maybe not. <laughs> whatever. Whatever you want to say. But it is what it is, as they say. So we've got some time for, again, for some questions, comments. I'm going to start with the dais. Anybody up here like to? First, uh, thank you for that uh, presentation. And uh, uh, a question kind of popped into my mind as, as you were talking, uh, particularly regarding your final comments, which is, uh, you know, there's an expression, penny wise and pound foolish. And, and what you're telling us is that uh, it seems to me that if we spend $100 today or whatever, we won't have to spend $1,000 two years from now or 10 years from now, et cetera. Uh, what I'm interested in is the uh, more precise quantification of what you've been talking about. Because it seems to me that mm -hmm. the, the way to get our elected leaders to make difficult decisions is trying to point out what it's going to cost down right. the road. And so if somehow we could quantify how much savings we could get if we spent, let's say, a billion dollars in California uh, by the Forest Service, by the, the, the state agencies, CAL FIRE, et cetera. What would that mean 10 years from now in terms of what we wouldn't have to spend on either fire suppression or other remediation ac activities that would have to be undertaken? And until we get... We don't have to be perfect, but, it, but until we get some rough approximation, I'm afraid that a lot of our elected leaders won't really understand what we're looking at. And, and you've basically laid out to me a doomsday scenario, which is we've really got to do a lot in the next 10 years. Otherwise, we're really going to pay for it economically, uh, you know, environmentally, et cetera. And this really is such a huge crisis that we all have to do a better job telling people who are going to be making decisions what has to be done. And we're just going to have to pay the price, you know? And there's going to have to be sacrifice. But it seems to me what you're saying, there's no getting around it. So I, I, th I think you're on it. I think we do need to pull in some of the better natural resource economists into the room and lay the situation out and look at the economics and the, the, what would be required on the front end, the medium term, and in the long term for the sustainability of the entire system. Right? We're already looking at agricultural um, producers moving either from south to north or from California to Oregon and Idaho. Right? You're absolutely right, and we and, and I'm not. I don't have training in that. That I don't have the capacity to do that. Um, but certainly, that is something that needs to be done in a, in a very thoughtful and systematic way, and then communicate in understandable terms, such that y anybody can can share that information. I think you're, it's a it's a perfect point. It's spot on, and I couldn't agree more. Okay. Anyone else here, Supervisor? <clears throat> yes. Uh, by the way, thank you for uh, the presentation. Thank you for the message of urgency. I uh, like to preach that message, but uh, <clears throat> if if I just summarize briefly, um, again, I'm an engineer, so you know I I think and I calculate things. Uh, we have overgrown forests all over. Yep. I take mine. Uh, about the time of Rim Fire, we argued that it was growing 225 million board feet a year. I don't know if that's the right number or not, order of magnitude. <clears throat> We were pulling off less than 25 million board feet a year. Our natural mortality was over 40 million board feet a year. 
the simple mass balance says you got a long way to go to catch up. We don't have the infrastructure to do that, and I and, and it's 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 all of it. You know, it's the submarketable trees, it's the marketable trees, it's uh, it's all sorts of the brush and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> At some point, if you're going to make this happen, you actually have to take more out than the forest is growing in a given year, or you don't catch up. It's just a fact of reality when you do the mass balance. And I just wanted to throw that in. Yep. People have to understand that the urgency requires drastic measures, things we're not prepared to do right now, and we need to understand what that means. Thanks. Appreciate Thank you. you Thank said. you for that comment. And, and I would just follow up with saying that I oftentimes, when I walk around in the forest, I spend a lot of time in the forest, have since I was an undergrad in the Los Padres. I blur my eyes and I imagine what it would look like if every other tree was gone. Not that that's the right approach. And again, I'm, you know, but, I'm, but, I, but I hear what you're saying and, and yeah. And every other tree is probably not enough. When no, you, I, I you, know. When you when you look at the and density. we need the big ones. We're lo right. We're losing the big. We've lost so many of the big ones. When you see those enormous sugar pines and ponderosa pines that have have died so quickly too, it's yeah. It's a fragile system, but it's a system. We it's can't a system. forget it. It's a system. It's a system, and we're a part of that system. Absolutely. Too right. Yeah. Thank okay. you for that comment. Done. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on this. You know, as I look through this presentation, I think about the logo uh, that's up on the screen here, the fire and the water. Uh, from a tribal perspective, those things go hand in hand. You know, when you take one away, you get more of the other. Um, and when I think about that relationship, that comes back to law for tribes. The fire is actually the, one of the first laws. And as we see unfolding in front of us, the story reminds me of our creation stories that talk about the first fire. And I teach this in my classes. I tell the students about the first fire, that every culture in the world, indigenous cultures, have a story of the first fire. We're living that right now. In our cultures, we also have a story that tells us about how we learn to use fire. And the story about putting fire on the land is really what we need to be looking at. The ideas of climate change, the effects of climate change, are not new to indigenous cultures here in California or anywhere else in the world. But... How we treat these landscapes has to draw on that. You talked about process in your presentation, the process of fire in the landscape, the ecology of that. People are intertwined within that. And that's what I think is really important to be able to bridge this and get through this for the future, is that we need to uh, bring those cultures in to this and make it part of the process again. You're absolutely right. And, and I was corrected once, and I should, have, I should have been more careful today. It's not just fire suppression, it's fire removal, right? And thank you for that point. You're absolutely right. Yeah. OK. You want to Woody? Yeah, I really appreciate the presentation and keep pushing the message you're pushing, a call to urgency and action on this. Um, because it's going to take a huge investment to turn the corner. Uh, and just being a land manager who has to look at things practically on the ground and how do you execute uh, prescribed fire projects and you re how do you return fire to the landscape, uh, it's a tricky question and, and it requires the alignment of a lot of things to go well. Um, it requires a good air window, it requires community support, it requires the funding to put boots on the ground, to put a line around the prescribed fire unit, prep it, um, and hopefully you're at a preparedness level in the state where you can get resources to support that preventative effort. Um, the press release, communications with communities and stakeholders, it's a big, big investment. Absolutely. I think as we talk about the urgency and the goal of returning fire to the landscape in a way that it produces good, healthy results. We've got to talk a little bit about what that investment really looks like and what it means. And I think it kind of comes to the point we heard up here, mm -hmm. the practicality of executing this stuff um, needs to be laid out for the public so we can have a good, invest good debate about <coughs> the investment requirements that are needed uh, to carry this out. I would absolutely agree with that, and I think we can look at places, two places like Yosemite and Sequoia Kings that have had active fire management programs for decades, 
right? And when you go, so I just, you, now I assume the position I do with Davis, but before that I was at a house in Oakhurst, so, right? So I'm very attuned into the CDF spotter planes. I got off my roof so fast, I had that whole routine figured out, right? You go from the Sierra or the, the Sequoia and you go into Yosemite, it's like two different ecosystems. Yeah. We have models. It's like we have the model, right? So how do we kind of package that up and, and pick parts of it off that we can share as information sharing mechanisms, right? I, I think we, it's, we have the knowledge, we have the people, we have the skills. I think and it, all of the elements that you outline, I, I completely agree with. Just, just one more point sure, on sure. this. If we can pull together a couple of good case studies <clears throat> yep. that show how this is executed on the ground and what that investment looks like, right. um, maybe we can inspire a little more interest and confidence that these things can be carried out, but it does require a lot of, of public support and investment. Well, one of the... And just so I'm an author, not on the forested part of it, but for the fourth California climate uh, assessment for the Sacramento Valley bioregion, right? But there are also mountain regions where case studies could be embedded into that. We can find out who's leading that chapter. That'd be a perfect place to get a case study in that did just that. And so I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. Yeah. Maybe we can chat more about that, how to do that later. Okay, Ashley. Yeah, thanks. Um, yep. And I think all of these comments are really great. And, um, you know, sitting in a state agency and talking to all of you a lot, um, I think we all agree on what needs to happen next, but the public at large or, you know, people out in the field don't necessarily know what Woody just said, that all of these pieces have to align and that there may be actually some costs to them personally, air, air quality, you know, restricted movement to actually putting some of these pieces on the ground. So when you talk about the fourth climate change assessment, some of these other tools, these papers that we're putting out, I think we collectively as a group need to work more on messaging them to the to who's not in the room, the average public, right? Yep. The, the people living in the area, the people living in urban environments <coughs> who want to turn on their taps and still get water and want to ask others to bear the cost of prescribed <coughs> fire, right? We need to be communicating this in a way that Again, people outside of this room will accept that this is the only path we can take to avoid those really stark images you've given to us. So I think it kind of all needs to tie together the, the really stark science with the reality of what this looks like on the ground, in households, in our pocketbooks, you know, to our potential energy impacts. So we can also make that comparison that Terry made that says what's the cost now versus the cost in the future. Right. Yep. And if we can put that piece together, you know, a combination economics, communication, science piece, that's going to be a really compelling piece. But I think in parts, that's what we've been doing for years. We need to combine them all and make them these really neatly packaged pieces that anyone can understand. And showing the connectivity. Right? I mean, the, some of the same areas that are adjacent to Sequoia Kings have three of the, the cities that have the worst air quality in the, in the country, by Celia Bakersfield Fresno. Right? It's an enormous public health issue. This is directly linked to that. Okay, I'm going to check. Anybody from the C SNC board? Bob Johnston. Nice presentation, uh, Stephen. Um, nice presentation. Uh, I guess what makes me sad is California is sitting on one of the largest pots of money available for doing the very thing we're talking about in this room. And yet, if you read the AB 32, uh, are we the third scoping plan now? Uh, you, don't, you don't see this as not in there, not even ag, much less forestry. And uh, nor have I seen uh, cost per ton of carbon removed, cost effectiveness calculations done so that we could look at the two largest kitties, which are cap and trade, <clears throat> which goes up uh, over time as it becomes more inclusive of California industries. And then second, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, whatever it's called now, uh, doesn't even have this as an expenditure category. And they are spending large amounts of money on things uh, that I can tell you as a retired researcher at the same campus that uh, Stephen's on, High-speed rail does probably does not reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, most urban transit projects probably do not, and they have large amounts of funding. Uh, and I'll, I don't want to bore you with it, but many other categories that California funds either have negative or very low cost effectiveness. And this is screaming for funding. Uh, this and uh, ag uh, carbon farming, it's called, carbon ranching, uh, which is farther along than the forest... Uh, carbon plan is, but, uh, you know, as, I'm, as I think a lot when I hear 
hard science presentations. It needs a policy chunk stuck on the end that brings us down into the world of funding and decision making. And I talk with Jim about this all the time. The votes are in the urban areas. They're funding, you know, urban forestry, urban rivers and stream restoration. And you look at the cost effectiveness numbers and it, we're wildly uh, funding the wrong things in California. So, so I agree with um, Terry, who started off saying this in, the, in a general kind of way, we need to get going on this. And I don't know how to make that breakthrough. No, but we, we definitely need a rubric or a framework where we take the, the projects, the investments, and throw them through a sieve to ensure that we're getting the greatest return for what we're putting in. And, and Ellie spoke to that too, right? I mean, historically, we're just like, oh, yeah, that looks like a neat place to go. I haven't been there in 25 years. I've always wanted to, you know. It's like that. That was great, but we're in a different time now. And, uh, yeah, I think your point's well taken. I've often had that same kind of head-scratching moment myself. And just a comment here, Ken and I can both reflect on this and Keely E2, but the, the most recent scoping plan does include a target for natural and working lands. So we do have a target of 15 to 20 million metric tons of reductions from the natural and working lands sector, a whole chapter on it. And we're working right now on a natural and working lands implementation plan so that we actually have a path forward to make sure we see those results. Keely E is working on that as well. So you've got a bunch of us in the room who are working on trying to get to reductions on that landscape. I think we were all frustrated that scoping plans in the past said forests are key, but that they didn't actually put a number behind it. So we're happy we have a number. Um, in terms of cost effectiveness, we do put out every year, um, it it's, comes out in the month of March, a cost effectiveness look at how the investments of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund cost in terms of dollar per ton. And we put that out specifically so legislators can say, you know, this is an effective use of our funding or not. But the legislators continue to fund a lot of those urban programs. So, um, so the, ca the, the calculator's out there, the, the metrics are out there. And I mean, it, it's beholden on all of us to call our elected officials and communicate that we need more than just urban funding out of the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. So, so I think that's ju just a note that those pieces are out there. They just need to be used in the way that you demonstrate or that you noted if, if you want to see these types of changes. And then in terms of total um, costs that, um, or total money that has gone to uh, Cal Fire for this type of work, that actually it has increased over time. And so we started at a pretty small allocation for CAL FIRE, but it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars now for healthy forests. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a good thing. Um, and we need more of this work to tell us where to concentrate those dollars so that we don't do the peanut butter approach, but we do the more watershed improvement program approach where we're looking at a regional response. So I've actually just made all of my talking points in these last two yeah. comments, <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but generally speaking, we are moving, I think, in the right direction. And do you want to chime in on exact numbers? Yeah, it's a point well taken. And uh, in the last, uh, now we've had four rounds of cap and trade funding, uh, uh, investing in forest health. It's gone from 21 million to 42 million. This year, as Jim pointed out, uh, 200 million okay. in forest health to Cal Fire, both for in broad scale projects as well as some of the in close fire prevention work. And in the, the governor's January 10 budget, the current budget proposal is 160 million. Uh, so, I mean, I grew up thinking that was real money, uh, but I also recognize the s scale of the challenge we're dealing with. And a uh, billion dollars a year, Terry talked about, is where we would love to be. But I think the point being is that it's being recognized. And at the risk of me putting all my speaking points out here, too, that's exactly what where we're going with a number of the initiatives that we're going to talk about here on this next panel. Great. OK. Anybody out in the audience? It's um, so my name is Eric Nacida. I'm the soil scientist on the El Dorado National Forest. Uh, I spend a lot of time on fires. Um, I think I've been on 80% of the fires that Barney uh, listed off uh, on a bear team, and we assess post-fire uh, effects. What I, what I get a little concerned about, and I'm not sure how well you separated the chaparral from the forest lands and your, um, and your effects on the forest. You know, we all think of forest, you know, a lot of people, the first thing you think of is timberland. Um, you know, you listed the timber species. Much of the destructive fires that we've had were ripping through chaparral and oak woodland. And some of these are on really steep slopes, some things we would never consider treating. And because of fire suppression, they've gotten really bad. Um, and um, we can go and treat the timberland, but until we start treating those, those steep, steep slopes, and I have no idea how to do it, and I don't know if anybody's looking at it, 
we're going to have very destructive effects on our watersheds. It's those chaparrales that are supplying a big chunk of our water supplies because they're lower elevations. They're, they're below the dams. And so what comes off of those slopes comes in as affected water. So I don't know if there's any kind of plan to treat those slopes, but there's a lot of chaparral steep country out there that's burning up. Uh, rim fire, that was a lot of chaparral. Station fire, 99% chaparral. Thomas fire, same. Sobranus, these are all chaparral fires. So I don't know, this is my two cents worth. Okay, thank you. I, we're gonna go a little longer on this item because Chief and uh, Ashley have said they've already talked on some of their talking points. I see hands, so <laughs> Craig and then Jim. Steve, thanks so much for not pulling punches on the need to reintroduce fire into the landscape. If we walk out of this room and once again that we're going to be able to log our way out of this situation without reestablishing that natural process, then we're dead in the water. And on a positive note, a lot of people in this room um, a couple years ago signed an MOU partnership that made that very commitment. And it, it's because of ecologists speaking out, it's because of 25 years of fire science that the Forest Service and Sierra Forest Legacy authored a document. Cal Fire and Director Pimlot immediately supported it and came on board, as did the Conservancy, as did the Park Service. <coughs> as did the Nature Conservancy. We've got, Ashley, we've got two air districts and a third one coming on, committed to promoting more fire and doing it in a collaborative way, where we burn, get the acres, start moving towards the acres we need, but protect public health at the same time. So I just want to say thank you for speaking truth and keeping it out there, because we can't do it with just one tool. Agreed. Thanks, Craig. Just to your left, Craig, there you go. This is maybe maybe repeating things, but um, we've heard that uh, fire suppression has absorbed all of our money, so we don't have money for treatment. Um, and yet, everybody says we have to have more fire on the land. You just sort of passed over very, very briefly the notion of managed wildfires. Uh, would it be possible to, in fact, uh, let fires burn in areas far away from the urban interface? spend less money on suppression and divert that money to treatment. So I'm not the expert to speak to this. I, I, one thing I can quickly <laughs> say is fire is not all the same, right? I mean, there are, there's a lot that goes into making the decision. I think Chief Pimlock could speak better to that. But I, I think that there is an opportunity for, you know, when, when, when Barney can call Ellie and there's an, there's an ignition and say, what are the values at risk? How can we evaluate this? I'm sure CAL FIRE has some similar rubric, but I would honestly defer to you, Chief Pimlock, on that. No, Steve, you're spot on. And the challenge we have, and this, again, goes back to a little bit what we were going to chat about, is that, um, you know, the public sees forest land as the national forest, the national parks. Well, in reality, half of the forest land in California is in private Right. ownership. And in reality, it's everybody's thinks big timber companies. Well, that's about 5 million acres, 9 million acres of forest land in California are non-industrial, small, family-owned forests, 50, 100, 200 acre uh, land ownerships. And uh, every one of those landowners has an objective. There's 40 million people living in California now. Yeah, many, most of them are in the urban areas, but so many of them are moving out into the foothills, the areas that go right up against national forest lands and others. So fire policy is, is a challenge in California in that absolutely need more fire on the landscape. I, I think we're all, like as Craig talked about, we signed this MOU because we are all committed within our abilities as agencies to ramp up this pace and scale. But we can't tomorrow just allow managed fire to start occurring on much of this land because it is not in a condition to take right. fire. We're going to continue to have our, the rim fires. So it's a, it's a, and I heard it over here, it's a combination of tools in the toolbox. It's some mechanical work. It's, it's commercial harvesting in some cases. Some of this has to pay its way out of the woods so these landowners will reinvest on the ground. Well, we've got to use this in combination. And the challenge we have private landowners, fire very quickly moves across you know, multiple ownerships on private land. And so we don't have the luxury of one forest plan covering 100,000 acres. We've got to work with these individual small land ownerships. What are their management objectives? In totality, getting work done on the ground as a whole. And so, yes, implementing 
uh, fire, for us, it's more prescribed fire. It's engaging these landowners and using prescribed fire as a tool uh, wherever we can in combination with other things. Okay, anything else? We've got one more we can do. Go ahead. So you're a, you have a doctorate in ecology. Is there a, a way, you've got talked about fire, harvesting, what about letting the logs just rot in place? Is that a possibility? Then the it's going to be 129 million times. <laughs> Okay. Is that, <laughs> is that a potential solution? Just let the thing fall and let it rot right there and go into the ground? So, so one of our interests is to get our forested systems to hold carbon, not release carbon, right? But if it's soil, the carbon is soil. If it's a rotted log, it turns to black soil and becomes well, part of the soil uh, cover on the rocky landscape, right? I'm not a geo chemist, so I'm going to defer some of the specificity of this question. Um, you know, the system is changing because it's out of balance, right? Tree, everything dies eventually, except for bristlecone pines, apparently. <laughs> but the, the way that the things are changing now is not leading us on a trajectory that's going to increase or get us back toward carbon reserves or stores. It's not enhancing watershed services. Um, there are a lot of concerns. It's obviously leading to enormous carbon emitting fires. I mean, you know, um, Jim, some of the statistics associated with the RIM event, right? I mean, we lost carbon in what a matter of weeks that large cities in California produce in a year, right? I mean, and we just came off the 2017 fire season. I don't know if there's any calculation yet on what we lost. Are there some? Not yet. Yeah. Not yet, yeah. I, I looked around. I didn't see any. Um, I, I understand your point. I mean, yeah, it, I guess it's better to have, I mean, I hate to say this, I guess it's better to have dead trees than trees that have burned because they're slowly releasing the carbon. But that's not getting us to enhanced ecosystem condition at all, I don't think. Um, and certainly there's an aesthetic of it, right? I mean, we, we go into a forest for this experience and have these expectations of these systems. And when we see them out of balance, there's a negative return on that too. I, I mean, it's a very complex question. I, I, I know I'm not answering it because I actually don't know the answer to it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you, you know, I, I don't think that's, that's not the answer, right? I mean, but someone else can maybe on the panel can speak to that more clearly than uh, Well, I the only thing I would say is I think the one thing we can say with absolute cer certainty is we'll have a lot of logs in the ground. And if they survive the multiple fires to where they are fully decayed, then they may become soil. But the mass fire paper you talked about from Scott Stevens yeah. suggests that when fire comes into that landscape, it will burn in a way that no fire has, has burned in this year before. So, you know, that's the one thing we are pretty sure of. We're going to have lots of those trees that are going to hit the ground. We have 129 million dead trees, tremendous efforts by Cal Fire, by the Forest Service, by a lot of parties, and we've removed about a million of them. About a million. About a million. So we got a lot of dead trees standing that are... We'll, I guess we'll, we'll see if yeah. they survive the fire, what happens next. Yeah, so. This is a grand natural experiment. Yeah. Yeah. It's like nothing we've seen before, right? I mean. And on that cheery note, yeah. let's think about it that way. <laughs> We're all part of the experience. Uh, I yeah. want to thank Stephen, and I also want to yep, thank um, Ellie. We really appreciate the presentation and uh, enjoyed yep, your comments. Thank you. Thank you. So um, you may or may not have noticed there was a very strategic tag team effort here as uh, Kaylee Bright tapped out and Todd Ferrara, who is Deputy Secretary at Natural Resources Agency and who sits on our board, um, has joined us here at the day. So welcome, Todd. And Stephen, are you still being reluctant? Because we'd love to have Stephen Moore from the State Water Board come up and have a seat up here. So now I've called you out. You have no choice. You have to come up. We have a name tag and everything. So. We'll know who you are. So uh, Stephen Moore is a member of the State Water Resources Control Board as well.